Well, hello, that's me again. Today is May 21st. It's Tuesday. And um, I want to start with um, some not good news for one of the most beautiful women out there and the wife of Bashar al-Assad, uh, Asma Assad. She is known as a desert rose. She is a stunningly beautiful woman, not just because she looks good, which she does. It's because obviously she projects an incredible class and uh, closeness to her people. Sadly, she was diagnosed with the leukemia and she be, she beat, the, uh, I uh, want to remind you, her breast cancer. So uh, I only wish to this incredible woman, outstanding woman, the, all the best in her fight. And yeah, good God, I mean, this woman basically overcame so much already in her life. So that's the uh, so to speak, you know, the thing I wanted to uh, express, it's my personal uh, opinion, obviously, but I'm pretty sure very many people around the world would support me in this uh, sentiment, apart from the fact that she is indeed one of the most beautiful women who are in politics. And um, that's one thing. Now, <coughs> pardon me, let's get to our goals, so to speak. Mr. Popov. Uh, Lieutenant General, the com former commander of the 58th Army has been arrested for bribery and all kinds of machinations with, for example, metals which have been provided for what is known as Soravikin, incorrectly, it was known as Stavitsky Line. So they stole like 2,000 tons of metal and sold it for, I mean, very significant sum of money. And together with uh, some dude from the uh, uh, Southern Federal uh, District of Russia. So, and as you might expect, there are, uh, so to speak, waves. And unlike those guys from the auxiliary uh, um, uh, departments, for example, like Mr. Timur Ivanov, who have been arrested, especially when Mr. Belousov came on board, we have now the former uh, general who was promoted, by the way, by one of the most important shysters uh, in State Duma, his State Duma deputy, uh, former General Gurulev, one of those people who have been together with Prigozhin, by the way, late Prigozhin, doing all those rounds, you know, creating the panic and defeatism, defeatism, pardon me, uh, around this whole uh, special military operation. And guess what? You play the stupid games, you win the stupid prizes. Now suddenly Gurulev, uh, who has been actually thrown out of the Ministry of Defense, and his son was involved in the criminal uh, machinations too, so his son has no comments about this. Well, I think so, it's just the start of the very healthy process, including cleaning all those prostitutes, which are called military correspondents, 99% of whom who are those, you know, holders of the Telegram channels and who spread all kinds of the BS, which of course later is, you know, what extracted by the Western media, especially mainstream media, and spread around as the real situation on the front. Of course, it's a complete baloney, but I mean, you know what, uh, we are facing a very interesting future with uh, cleaning and mopping up of the Russian defense minister because some very interesting personalities will pop up and Popov hasn't been in command of the 58th army now for a while for a long time and he was under investigation also for a while the same as was the situation with the Timur Ivanov and other people of this nature so uh, they better tremble all those guys in Ministry of Defense who had uh, ulterior motives you know and I as I already stated there will be very many interesting contacts between them and one of the, well, basically criminal, Mr. Prigozhin, and this Wagner group. So, that is interesting, and it's extremely healthy, actually. It improves uh, the climate and uh, the eases the job of general staff, which is involved in, well, we you know what it is involved in, and uh, so, as we can see yourself, if you look at the so-called, and they panic, so-called Kharkov offensive, uh, you can see on the map that, uh, well, Klishevka fell today, so, and we see all kinds of the movements of the front, but then again, you know, uh, the issue here is Russians are not intent to take 
Kharkov by force. Nobody would. Why would you uh, really go there and kill a lot of peaceful people, civilians, and then, you know, just kill unnecessarily your fighters, your soldiers? So, yeah, it's just the movement all along the front, as you can see yourself. And as the statistics tells us today, well, yesterday, actually, for, for yesterday, you can see yourself that there, well, I understand, oh, listen, it sounds horrible when I say this, but it is what it is. This is how operational level officers and planners think. The production, so to speak, the uh, effectiveness of the fighting, whatever is left of the armed forces of Ukraine. And as you can see yourself, just yesterday you had <coughs> 12 tanks and APCs, uh, 28 armored vehicles, 17 artillery pieces and mortars, and uh, yeah, the uh, butcher's bill is horrendous. And now actually, uh, it's averaging around 12 to 1400 a day of the uh, military personnel. And um, let me put it this way: how how to describe it to you? Uh, many people still do not understand what tragedy is unfolding there. Listen, make no mistake, I have no sympathy for Banderites, and actually the, I have no sympathy for many so-called Ukrainians, uh, much of who voted for, you know, killing Russians. So, but I cannot deny the fact of the absolute slaughter of the Ukrainian cannon fodder. This is all courtesy of people such as Victoria Nuland, who is now calling on attacking uh, Russian uh, territory, and all other those people who are war criminals by definition, and they will be named as such once the, um, you know, tribunal starts in earnest in Moscow and Donetsk. I, I assume it's going to be Donetsk. Certainly in Moscow. So, and when you look at those numbers, certainly they are terrifying. And again, uh, we are looking at what is provided by Russian Defense Ministry. And Russian Defense Ministry is extremely conservative in its estimates. And it provides only what it can count. No uh, rear operational tactical rear numbers are included in, in it. So, and we have now the situation with Mr. Zelensky losing his, uh, well, how to put it politely, uh, well, I'll let just read what Mr. Medvedev stated yesterday. And the reason I underlined here in TAS, uh, the word beliefs, it's not beliefs, it's machine translation. I deliberately went for the Russian source, not for the RT here. And Mr. Medvedev says that's what was stated there, but yeah, it's not beliefs. Then Zelensky should be put on trial or liquidated. And uh, after the capitulation of Kiev, President Vladimir Zelensky should be arrested and put on trial or eliminated as a terrorist. This was stated to task by Deputy Ch Chairman of the Security Council of the Russian Federation, Dmitry Medvedev. Further, after the surrender of Ukraine, we are not indifferent to the fate of Zelensky. He must be caught and put on trial. So, and the guy becomes now a running man because, and though Mr. Putin and through Mr. Peskov, uh, he stated that the Kremlin's position is that, you know what, it is for Ukrainian judiciary to decide if <coughs> basically Mr. Zelensky um, legitimacy is valid, so to speak. Uh, but yes, it's, you know what, it's just general platitude, which you have to use, you know, and speak to all those, you know, correspondents and journalists to give them something. But reality is, of course, he is no more a president. He's a dictator. And <coughs> because of that, he, he knows that his game is up. He probably will be, uh, well, who knows what he will be, killed by uh, whoever guards him now, SAS, SAS, or whatever. And so Reuters took the interview with him. Obviously, Reuters will never go and try to take interview with people who really decide anything in Russia, because you know what, that's who they are. But here it is. 
Ukraine President Zelensky speaks to Reuters in an exclusive interview yesterday, and he is complaining on the currently the situation at the front is one of the most difficult because a new Russian offensive has begun in the direction of Kharkov. A very powerful wave of fighting is going on in Donbass. It is remarkable that even Victoria Nuland, uh, speaking yesterday, she for some reason called Kharkov a Russian city. Oh my gosh, a Freudian sleeve, which is actually true. Kharkov is a Russian city, it never was a Ukrainian one. So, but uh, the point is that they are losing their marbles, honestly. And just to demonstrate to you what is going on in Ukraine, and especially in Kharkov, people in Kharkov on the ground, they report that the city is actually empty. The reason it is empty because men do not go out anywhere, because they will be immediately corralled, thrown into the van, and uh, you know what, sent to the front line to die, because they will die. And uh, we have now this report of CNN Women Jobs. They've been reporting on this for a while, but now, if you can see yourself today, CNN talks about Ukrainian women, women brave gender norms taking on dangerous jobs during the fight against Russia. As their country fights to repel Russian forces, Ukrainian women are taking on the roles and responsibilities previously unavailable to them, <clears throat> often in challenging and dangerous circumstances. Thousands of Ukrainian men left their jobs to join the military and defend the country. And here's obviously classic CNN BS, the same, uh, which is actually doesn't even do the good job trying to re retell the Financial Times article about the fate of uh, uh, women in Ukraine who also now work as metallurgists and the smelting plants, the jobs reserved only for men. But it is not because they take and just decided to go and you know what substitute the men in the workplace because the men allegedly want to fight for Ukraine uh, many don't in fact is probably majority they know what is going to happen to them and of course CN avoids the most important point of this which by the way Financial Times actually talks about and it talks about the fact that most of those men now are sitting at homes it's not like they went to fight for Ukraine. Majority of those men are sitting now in their apartments behind locked doors because they know the moment they go out to work, the moment they go out to the grocery store or what have you, they will be immediately grabbed from the street and be thrown in this van and delivered to the, well, I, I don't know, a week training, so-called training. They will show them how to, you know, assemble, disassemble Kalashnikov. They will know them how to tell them how to throw grenade and they will be sent to the front line to die because I'm not going to be uh, speculating now um, you know uh, how to put it politely I actually I am speculating but it's kind of you know educated guess uh, we are not talking now 1 to 10 uh, kill ratio we're talking more like 1 to 30 if not 1 to 40. What is happening now at the front line obviously I cannot put it here but there are many uh, videos for example, like it was yesterday with the Ahmad Special Forces guys, you know, Chechen, Russian, the the bunch of internet. It's international brigade, uh, uh, and they took their one of the support points of the uh, Ukrainian defense, and they were shocked. The reason they were shocked because they said while we were actually facing them, we already could smell horrible smell of the decomposing bodies. What they found there, and you can see it, is absolutely stunning. They had the living Ukrainian soldiers literally sitting in their trenches and, and you know, their um, dugouts with the decomposing bodies of their fellows who have been killed. This is just absolutely, and uh, you know, I, I don't know how to de describe it. It's obviously a complete mental moral breakdown of the armed forces there. And uh, the guys, uh, you know, from Ahmad, you can see it in the video. Again, I'm not going to be putting this video up because obviously uh, YouTube will not allow this, but they go on and say, that these are not normal people, they're Satanists. And in some respect, they are. 
So, well, as are, for example, Europe. I mean, what is happening there is Satan's ball in Europe and in the United States. And it's a complete moral and implosion, the generation of the civilization. So, and when you look at this and you put this together, you can see yourself what is going on in terms of the panic, of course. And... Uh, the, if that hasn't been enough, now we have this, what is the call, I would call all this strategic framework. There you go. Yesterday, China floats a record amount of dollar assets. China sold a record number of U.S. bonds in the first quarter of this year, highlighting the country's shift away from dollar assets, the latest data from the U.S. Treasury Department reveals. Beijing has divested a total of 53.3 billion in treasuries and agency bonds combined in the first three months of the year, while at the same time increasing its purchases of gold and other commodities data showed. And so uh, people, you know, begin to understand that United States did it all, and they say the handling of Russian reserves by the U.S. and other G7 countries, including threat of expropriations and sanctions, like prompted China to reduce its exposure to its treasury assets to avoid being similarly targeted. Craig Shapiro, a microeconomic advisor at Laduke Trading, told Newsweek on Saturday, referring to the seizure of Russian assets. Now, those morons in Europe, and again, they are morons because they don't understand. They already committed kind of suicide, but it's just kind of, you know, expanding more in leaves and bounds. So they want to uh, send their perspective percentages of the uh, profit on Russian frozen assets uh, towards um, Ukraine. They say it's about three billion dollars. It's really pocket chain change and it's going to be stolen by all kinds of the Zelensky and uh, the other coterie. And um, what can I say? Uh, when Mr. Lavrov says that uh, we at least one generation are going to be talking to Europe, I think so. It's going to be more than that because the, what happens to Europe, I mean, and especially in terms of the bureaucratic structures of European Union and European Commission, you cannot talk to them with, at all. I mean, it's the uh, clockwork which doesn't work. You are talking to people who are, well, Satanist for in, in, in intents and purposes. And did you see the person who is going to be uh, wearing the Olympic torch uh, in Paris? Uh, yeah, I think so. It's a good time now to leave all those, you know, as I already stated, uh, organizations si such as International Olympic Committee and things of this nature. So, and... Um, here comes this issue of the obviously International Criminal Court issuing the uh, arrest warrants for Mr. Netanyahu and you know uh, and also Hamas. I mean, good luck with that. They have nothing to enforce it with, but it is very good litmus test again to show the double standard of the United States, for example, towards what is happening basically genocide in uh, in Gaza. But we have this uh, coalescing of those things which. Um, using terminology from the famous Highlander, as Sean Connery stated, you know, to Highlander, hey, that's quickening, okay? Things are developing so fast, it's unbelievable. And now we have the situation with China divesting, and this is just the start, and eventually, as uh, many people are already speaking, Dmitry Arlov was speaking about it for a while now, listen to his wonderful interview to Nima, and it's about this unit and essentially what will be the uh, transitional uh, currency or uh, financial instrument for the trade within the BRICS. So, and uh, speaking of which, of course, you have to understand that um, uh, it's not only the situation with the West in terms of the financial or military things. In terms of military, there is no point to uh, discuss it uh, anymore. Everything is clear. But uh, look at this. There is in the intellectual part of which we I'm constantly stress. Like yesterday, oh no, pardon me, last video when I was talking about the General Cavoli. And listen, I know Italian friends also put that. You know, and Andre just go look up the meaning of the Cavoli, Cavolo, what it is. Yeah, it is cabbage okay so and yeah there were obviously as you might understand all kinds of the low brow humor about mr kawori having the head of cabbage and things like that but the point is let me demonstrate to you here's mr glenn diesen uh 
during the interview, I, I usually don't listen to him. I, I agree with many points whenever I listen to him. But here I was uh, struck by when he was giving the interview. And uh, the, the interview was titled beautifully, Hegemonitis, Why the West Has Become So Dumb. Wow. That's the strategic issue, you know, not even the issue that, you know, Russia has called the main threat for United States and national security strategy, this document, and they just, you know, not very bright people write those things, you know, so, and we know this, but yes, as Glenn Deason points out, and the title is very correct, why they are so dumb. We are looking at the intellectual, not just decline or precipitous decline. It is complete intellectual degeneracy. People absolutely lost in the uh, real world. Well, there are many, obviously, factors which influence that. But just to demonstrate to you, this is, uh, you know, I don't watch it, but it created such a huge, I mean, wave that, uh, here it is, uh, this is the, uh, she's a, uh, I mean, certified imbecile, and she thinks very highly of herself, uh, actually, people say they never saw real proof of her passing the bar, and her intellectual level considered, I think so, she wouldn't be able to pass the bar, but her name is Sonny Hostin, and she was at The View, or she is in The View, and the video host embarrassingly claims the solar eclipse is a sign of climate change. Yes, she stated that, you know, with the climate change, the uh, solar eclipses are just started to, you know, appear because of this whole situation, evidently. And even uh, some, such uh, dumb as a stump, uh, what's her name, Whoopi Goldberg, had to correct her. And Sonny Hostin stated that, no, that's what I read in the books. And so let me put it this way, guys, uh, in the simple terms. ABC is one of the major TV channels in or networks in the United States. And guess what? You have people of this quality, or what her name that she is absolutely the deranged bitch, Joy Bihar, people without education, without any knowledge, without any useful skills, and they sit there and pontificate on the issues. I don't know. But this is what actually the American media are. And Sony Hostin is not an exception. That's the, uh, the whole thing. Everybody who talks about it, yeah, they will believe that, yeah. Because, you know, sunsets, well, you know what? We have the situation with the flat earth for crying out loud, okay? So, and uh, when you look at this, it's just, uh, my gosh, we are living idiocracy. And speaking of which... So, uh, one of the NGOs, they, uh, you know, uh, created this report, Democracy Perception Index 2024. And I can tell you one thing immediately that uh, when, if you go to anywhere now in the normal, in normal countries and say we're democracy, people will laugh into your face. And, but still, it's important because these guys worked, they, you know, spend their time, resources and efforts, I mean, trying to convince us or not convince and report to us about what is going on with this democracy thing and how it is perceived in the world because, well, let's face it, world, it lives by perceptions too. And for example, uh, media are in the perception management, as is primarily whole Washington, which the only thing they can do, they cannot fight war, they cannot run the economy, they, they don't know what they're doing, but the only thing they are good at, and even that is questionable now, is perception management. So here we have this, for example, uh, democracy, uh, how it is, you know, people say uh, if there is not enough democracy in their country. And look at this, I pointed out that in the red, obviously, it's not enough, that's what it means. And in Russia, as you can see yourself, you have that not enough, about one third of people say. Well, in the United States, however, as you can see yourself, almost half says that there is not enough democracy. Well, people in, in Venezuela also say that it's very bad situation with the democracy. And again, you have to understand what democracy is. It's a hollow term. It's a simulacra. So United States is not a democracy, really. It's kind of democratic republic, but in reality, it is oligarchy covered with the, with the uni party, with different uh, um, uh, wings of this uni party, you know, accusing each other of, 
you know, being, you know, crap. So, well, that's about it. That's the democracy in uh, in American view. In Russia, it's uh, totally different, but they say not enough democracy. Okay, that's fine. As you can see yourself that um, uh, you already can say that if you look at Hungary, for a, for example, if people say uh, that there is not enough democracy there, you already can say that it pretty much all those uh, polls and statistics is fraud. It's garbage in, garbage out, because uh, you know what? Uh, yeah, we saw democracy when we saw how Mr. Fizo of uh, Slovakia was, uh, you know, assaulted and shot several times. That's what they call democracy. Only things which like, you know, uh, they like in the United States. So here we have that thing. They talk about that most people view corruption as a threat to democracy in their country. Well, correct. You can see yourself that United States, it's probably correct, Paul. But yeah, about, what can I say? Well, 75%, three quarters view it like this. Then you can see yourself South Africa, which, yeah, I understand, it is utterly corrupt country, let's face it. But, uh, yeah, then you have those, you know, people in Sweden, uh, yeah, Swedish, they will agree, w w whatever is, you know, imposed on them, they have no spine, they will probably be substituted with all kinds of refugees very soon, and there will be no Sweden left. But, hey, they say that, okay, that's fine. So, and then they talk about democracy perception. Oh, here's per perception. So, as you can see yourself, <laughs> uh, we have this, uh, yeah, numbers of EU um, kind of fluctuating between 32 to 34. Yeah, I mean, the totalitarian uh, uh, postmodernist society in Europe certainly is democratic. I'm being facetious. But look at this. China is growing. And even Russia went from those abysmal numbers to from minus 32 to minus 14. Oh my gosh, whatever that means. No, no. But hey, you have this democracy gospel and there are many people in especially American Academy who buy this crap. I mean, they go and talk about democracy, whatever that means. And what is the funniest, of course, we know that United States is not democracy anymore. And its, uh, it's uh, governance is utterly corrupt. But then, of course, how the United States is viewed in the world, around the world. Well, I'm not surprised that uh, the United States is viewed in the world net positive in India, and actually in Vietnam too. It's actually not surprising. We have now South Korea, Iran. Yeah, Iran has a very uh, pro-American streak, pro-Western streak. Uh, it's a known fact. But look at this. Uh, now let's go to the countries which really add to the, so to speak, uh, revolutions of the global order. China, very negative. Russia, very negative. Indonesia, the largest uh, Muslim country in the world. Yeah, very negative view of the United States. Turkey, yes. And Turks actually have a very positive opinion about Russia. So we have Malaysia and things like that. Look at this. Australia. They don't like American, uh, American democracy, obviously. So uh, this one I can totally believe. So maybe they did some good job at properly uh, handling their statistics. But as you can see yourself. So that's uh, the countries when you look attentively at uh, uh, countries in the red. Many, very many important countries there. And surprise, Germany is also there. So who would have known that? And in conclusion, this is the dem uh, democracy and popularity. Uh, U.S. popularity <laughs> has taken a hit globally in 2024, particularly in MENA countries, but also in Europe. At the same time, attitudes toward China and Russia have become more positive all around the world outside of Europe and the U.S. While the United States remains more positively viewed globally, Russia and China are now seen as positively as the United States in most MENA and Asian countries countries surveyed. Hmm, okay. Would, do I believe this? Yes, I do believe this, because obviously, uh, how to put it politely, Middle East, non-aligned countries and things of that nature, Global South, uh, Russia is becoming very popular there, and so is China. So, because, plus, they bring up you know, they talk to people uh, like equals, they bring on the investment and all those things, they build things in Africa, for example, in Middle East, and uh, yeah, and militarily, Russia is beating the West, I mean, hands down, and um, you will probably see uh, 
some uh, views expressed on this issue from me and Scott Ritter uh, on RT and um, probably tomorrow, after tomorrow. I know I have Rick, Rick Sanchez tomorrow, so I'm going to be giving the interview. And uh, yeah, we have to finally define what democracy is. What do they even mean by this? You know, so and uh, I'm not going to go there. And in my next video, probably I will make about the situation with the uh, how Russia saves the real West, not European countries. European countries are not Western anymore. And that's about it for today, guys. And I want to express my profound gratitude to my wonderful patrons for what they do by supporting me. And as always, guys, those who like what I do, please, please subscribe to my channel. And those who like what I do, please support me on Patreon or buy me a coffee and two. I would really appreciate this. So that's it for today, guys. And uh, have a nice rest of the week. And I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.